finally, the Station Nightclub Fire Memorial is up and running. The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you in part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. I'm sure for so many it feels like yesterday, yet it's so many years. And uh, finally this past weekend, the uh, celebration, which is a weird word, of the, of the Station Nightclub Fire Memorial. They also are continuing to raise money for it, and so uh, stay tuned for information on that. But the story behind the story tonight with one of our guests. Stay with us. Thanks for tuning in. Glad to have you aboard on this Thursday evening. Let's go to the rundown and check on some things. This has been one of the worst debacles I've ever seen. Mishandled, uh, balls dropping, you name it. The uh, headline in WPRI.com begins the conversation. And we're going to kind of go slowly here because I want to talk this thing through. That headline that talks about $71 million for the, for the new stadium for the Paw Sox might make you think that this is, you know, all a high-risk financial adventure. What you need to understand and what you should read through is the legislation. When's the last time you read the legislation? It's like reading the Bible. See, people say, yeah, I read the Bible. Do you read the Bible? Have you, have you read the Bible? Have you read any legislation? Uh, there's bonding of A, B, and C in this whole thing. The Paw Sox are putting $12 million in cash down in this proposal. There are three sets of bonds. One is $33 million worth of payments guaranteed from the Paw Sox to facilitate the first bond. So it's $33 million in real value, but really it'd be more like $55 million over the course of the 30 years that they run this bond. The second bond is $23 million for the state paid for by revenues that for the most part exist already out of McCoy in sales tax revenues from the stadium so to speak. The third bond is $15 million for the city of Pawtucket, which is projected to be facilitated through property taxes and the development that goes along with the, with the, the new stadium at, at Slater Mill. Uh, and so you have to think this stuff through and know that already at McCoy Stadium, we are in a public-private finance project as we speak. It is amazing to me uh, the kind of discord in this community and the we're not paying a doggone nickel of state taxpayer money or city money for this thing for something we're already that much into. The difference is this equation is a whole lot more equity based, meaning real money from the Pawtucket Red Sox. Having said that, you've seen this video ad nauseum. Governor Raimondo a week or so ago said, yeah, I think the numbers look, look okay. This proposal um, appears to me um, to be that the ballpark would pay for itself uh, and would be self-supporting. Okay. So the governor, you know, floats all this, and she floats all this stuff to legislative leaders as well. The Speaker of the House has long said, since he got his uh, fanny kind of kicked in for supporting the Providence Project that never went anywhere, meaning the Paul Sox to Providence, in 2015 has kind of played rope-a-dope with this thing but has been transparent about it he has said listen the governor's been working it and the governor's been working this thing through her commerce secretary Stefan Pryor for months and months and in fact a month ago they had all the numbers that we're reading about now set but for some reason she would float the concept that she kind of agrees with it tells everybody in the legislature that she is going to stand by it tells the people in Pawtucket that she's all for it and then she kind of excuse the term, throws up over the whole thing. So Speaker Mattiello, when he was talking with me yesterday, uh, last week on the radio, uh, was pretty consistent. It's unfair to my colleagues or the public to start a process anew uh, emanating out of Kentucky. So I, I'm curious to see what the foundational work that's been done by the governor's office and the Commerce Corporation. If there is foundational work, we'll look at it. Well, there was foundational work, but the governor never handed it to the speaker. The clock's been ticking. There's pressure on the look of transparency in this session, right? And then Senate President Ruggiero, who was here just a week ago saying he likes the idea himself, who was kind of out there on the lead of the governor, two days ago, throws his own little bomb into the mix. I don't think that inserting a subject like that at the last minute uh, is, 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 is a good move on the Senate's part. I think it's something that we really have to look at uh, very closely and study and scrutinize it. That's because my uh, sources tell me anyway that uh, he's not too happy with the governor playing rope-a-dope with this thing because she kind of pulled it back a half a day before he made that commentary to say, I don't know, uh, 
uh, the legislature has to kind of seize the moment on this whole thing. So in the meantime, poor Mayor Don Grebian comes to the microphones literally begging for some support on this thing, asking for another two weeks worth of legislative attention, kind of in an extended session, uh, because he's saying come July 1, the Paw Sox are no longer monogamous with Pawtucket. If we cannot put our political concerns aside, we risk losing this team and nearly $2 million in existing, and I say that, in existing revenue that currently generates out of that stadium. That $60 million of lost revenue over the next 30 years if the team leaves Rhode Island. For those of you who say no, state, no, no public money for this project, there's not much I can say to convince you. you. You've just been diseased by 38 studios and the like. You don't do much homework on how the world works, honestly. And if that feels like it's condescending, take it the way you want to. I mean, the, the point of the matter is, is that we are inflicted with a no, 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 no disease. And we're also misserved or disserved, really, by leadership in this state that has stunk the joint out, led by the governor who has fallen down and just completely shown why nobody in the legislature trusts her because she says one thing and then pulls out and does another. I don't know where this thing is going to go. It's sad. All right, uh, tuition plan rollback. So meanwhile, the governor has been running around trying to get this two years of free college tuition plan through, and now we're seeing more and more reflection in the news, headlines like this uh, that indicate that she's willing to negotiate something back further. Well. You know what? The governor's kind of put herself in a not so uh, enviable position because we've got $100 million less money coming in than expected. That's actually $100 million plus in terms of budgeting woes. And Speaker Mattiello, who thinks that she usurped him with the car tax plan, has no love at all for this uh, education program. And uh, frankly, it's dead in arrival on the House side. So I don't know where the college tuition thing is going to go. But the, all the equity that she's put into this, I'm talking about political equity now, and if she comes up with nothing, she's having a bad year of her own doing. Uh, we'll see. Next item, interesting, creative in the Senate. Headline here, Snow Day Bill passes the committee. This is uh, one Woonsocket state senator who says, hey, listen, I think we ought to learn that there are other ways to educate the kids, especially when snow is falling and they can't get to school for multiple days on end. Socket Middle School had some issues with their roof and they themselves had to shut down that, those two buildings for an extended period of time. I think it was like five days to shovel off the roof and stuff. So that added a lot of um, problems for the kids for you know, making up the days towards the end of the school year and it really extended into late June. I think Senator Picard's got a neat idea there. Um, you know, at the college level, the kids are online courses all the time. So they can get some assignments and have to do some work at the keyboard rather than just playing games online. Makes sense to me. Uh, nobody wants to do school after June 15th. And the truth of the matter is, no work gets done anyway. So why not give it a roll? All right. Um, good news. The Station Memorial is, is up and visible. And uh, my bad, I haven't seen it yet. It only uh, came to life this weekend. Uh, graduations and stuff like that, you know, but uh, Gina Russo has been on this since the tragic day that seems like what, yesterday and so long ago? Is, is, is it fair to say that? Absolutely. How are you? I'm doing great. Physically? I mean, I'm a little beat up, yeah. a little tired. From the work on the from project? From the work, from being a survivor. Um, it's been a long 14 years. Yeah. I mean, lots of your fiance, Fred, we, we've mm -hmm. talked about that before. Yeah. I, I, is it appropriate still to offer condolences after 14 years? I mean, is, is, do people say that? I, you know, they I, do. I always say that to you. So I'm so sorry for your loss. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Um, just give me the Cliff's notes on this, and then we'll talk about how this all came together, and, and we'll talk about some of the fundraising on it. Uh, do you feel celebrative? Do you feel relieved? What do you? What's the emotion? All of that, overwhelmed with pride. Um, so the Wednesday night before the, grant, the opening on Sunday, um, I took a walk through by myself and um, kind of said my piece to a lot of the, the victims of the, of the fire, walked to every monument, and for the first time in 14 years, didn't feel any pain in my heart anymore. Um, it, it's been overwhelming. Um, it's absolutely beautiful, and the response from a lot of the family members has been just pure joy and peace that they've got somewhere beautiful to go. That's the end of the show.
but there's more to talk about. Stay with us. So here's Eyewitness News coverage of the opening of the memorial. Bringing the music back. That was the goal of Sunday's dedication ceremony at the Station Fire Memorial Park in West Warwick. Hundreds gathered at the site where 100 lives were lost 14 years ago. Jason Morton, 38. Local students raised single red roses as each victim's name was read aloud. The families and friends of those victims and the survivors of that terrible night coming together to dedicate the park that was 14 years and millions of dollars in the making. Long after all of us are gone, this site will educate and inspire future generations of Rhode Islanders, keep the memories of the victims alive, provide cautionary lessons that could help save lives in the future, honor the heroism of everyday Rhode Islanders who did incredible things to help their brothers and sisters. Treasurer Seth Magaziner, one of many local dignitaries to take to the podium, reflecting on the lives lost and others that were forever changed. Oh, this is never the final chapter. This is a new beginning. Jody King lost his brother Tracy in the fire. For David Kane, it was his son, Nicholas O'Neill, the fire's youngest victim. Now his name forever memorialized with the 99 others. And I'm really thrilled with it. And I think it's going to bring a lot of, a lot of solace to people. Singer Billy Gilman sung about heroes, those who gave and risked their lives to save others, those who sacrificed, those who survived. On Sunday, hundreds gathered at the scene of the tragedy, now transformed into a lasting tribute. Uh, spectacular. Thank you. Uh, this finally came together uh, almost, not by accident, but by public dialogue. Uh, absolutely. D tell, tell the story on how that happened. Sure, absolutely. In 2012, uh, just about the beginning of September 2012, um, I called into your radio show um, because it was, uh, Dave was, Dave Kane was on talking about the property and, you know, how it was time that, so, you know, they needed to turn it over and I called into the show and said, you know, let, let us tell you what the current board is doing and what we're hoping there for. There was a dispute. There was, absolutely. Um, Dave thought we should take the land by eminent domain, um, you know, and that the government should get involved. And uh, the, the current board members just didn't want to do that. We wanted the Villanova family to come to us willingly and trust us to do a good job. The owners of the property. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Where the, where the nightclub was. Yes. And um, so was on your show uh, about 4.30 that afternoon. I got a phone call um, that Mr. Villanova's attorney wanted to speak with me. And so I got home and gave him a call, and by that uh, Monday, that following Monday, the land was ours. Uh, Mr. Villanova was an incredible man to meet. His story and his compassion for what happened that night on February 20th um, is something I'll never forget, and I'm grateful to the family. Were you surprised that they, he was so responsive? Because there was a quiet, a real quiet period that had occurred for many, many, many years. There was. Um, you know, a lot of it was based on the lawsuits and the criminal cases that were going on, so he really was stuck. Mm. I think him and his family would have liked to have gotten rid of it a long time ago. Mm. But because of the cases and because of the lawsuits, they had they couldn't really do much. Um, and then they had some conflict with past board members, or they weren't feeling very um, receptive to certain people. And, uh, you know, I, I hate to say it that way, but it was reality. And um, well, there was a lot, we came there was along. a lot of personalities, and there was yes. a lot of pain. Absolutely. I mean, every, everything that was going on here was motivated by pain. Uh-huh. Absolutely. So, Anger. Uh, you uh, kept the disposition mm -hmm. of being able to compartmentalize, I think, uh -huh. the terrible pain of being victimized yourself and injured yes. badly, mm -hmm. losing your fiancé, Fred. Um, but you were pretty steady through this whole thing. You and others. Yeah. yeah, I felt if I stayed steady, more people would hear me. Um, that when you're ranting and raging and screaming, people shut you down. And, and that's exactly what I think happened in the past. Um, so my mission was always to stay calm, as calm as I could, tell my story, and, and have people trust me and know that I'm, I want to do the right thing by the 100 who passed away. Is it too late uh, to talk about that night anymore? It's never too late. It's how our 100 will stay alive. 
I'm not talking about remembering, I'm uh -huh. just talking about the logistics. And the all logistics. Of that. That, Painful, painful, painful night. Do you still remember a lot of it? Absolutely, absolutely. But I don't think we should ever forget the pain from that um, and the laws that went into place. And I understand that um, you know they're still trying to kick some of them out um, because people just can't afford to make the upgrades um, that, that are the necessary. Fire codes. And the fire like. codes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so what happened was unfortunately, though. But you know, not to get into it, but but things tend to swing in dramatic pendulums. Absolutely. And I think some of the some of the, the regulations became draconian just out of, um, I think, overreaction and maybe guilt. Uh, I'm not Absolutely. sure which, but uh, mm -hmm. having said that, we'll talk about some of the morals of the story, if there are any, and uh, some of the financial issues that still uh, need our help. Stay with us. Absolutely. Exactly. Uh, welcome back. Uh, Gina Russo, one of the, the, the chief uh, players, heroes in this memorial, uh, finally coming to bear at the nightclub site. And Daniel Barry is here, who's helped in the fundraising effort. Dan, welcome to the show. Nice Thank to have you. you. Um, how did you hook up? A um, few years ago, I kept thinking, there's no way I'm going to raise all this money. I'm, I'm on my own. I don't have those kind of connections. Um, you knew what the money was. It's been a $2 million project yes. so far, right? Yes, yep. Who and told you it was going to be that expensive? Um, well, with the help of Gil Bain and coming together with our, um, you know, what we wanted to do uh, with the designers, the plan that they had put together, they estimated that it would cost us about $2 million. And I just didn't know those kind of people. I don't, it didn't work in that kind of world. Um, and Dan's name kept coming up um, at a couple of meetings that I'd had with different um, pe business people in the community. and. I finally decided it was time to give him a call, and, mm -hmm. and he just has truly been our savings grace. Um, he has, he's, he's the reason why we've raised our two million. He brought in all the right people. So you've been in the business doing this kind of stuff for quite some time? Over 35 years. All right. What was the uh, strategy? Tell us about the success of raising a couple mil. Uh, the, the important part was getting the right leadership in the state. This was a statewide tragedy so that um, everyone was affected from Wesley to Woonsocket, whether you had a, someone in the fire or not. Um, everybody remembered that evening where they were, where they heard about it. So we had a way of, of getting folks from different locations. And the key thing was getting the leadership. And we started with um, Governor Don Kachiri and his wife, Sue. Uh, then we got Joe Maccarella involved from Washington Trust. We've got um, strong leadership. Uh, Gil Bain was always there as strong supporters. We also got the trade union leadership where they provided in-kind donations of, of significant amounts to make it worthwhile. But it was leadership from different parts of the state um, because it, this was a very difficult campaign. Um, there is no set group of people we can go to. Uh, it was uh, no history of giving or anything like that. So we had to create a need. Or not, the need was there. We had to create a way of folks to understand that I mean, there wasn't no, There's no pattern of giving for, for this kind of, no. I mean, veterans, I don't mean to be uh, uh, nonchalant about patterns of charitable giving, but we you are it, right it. there are silos and there there are constituencies and there are targets and there are demographics and there's all of that. This thing was from Pluto, right? Absolutely, it was offline. Uh, foundations don't give to memorial parks. Uh, corporations typically don't give to memorial parks. So everything was off kilter a bit and they had to find a way to uh, make this a priority. Some could do it but others had gui bylaws and guidelines that they could not contribute. You mentioned the former governor uh, who, who has been uh, eerily silent in, in the community um, and I think that's too bad. I think he was one of our most terrific governors. I mean c clearly the 38 Studios politics uh, has kept a damper mm -hmm. on his on his public persona, and I think in a lot of ways the public kind of misses him. I know I do from a, a public point of view, uh, but his his leadership and commandeering um, the night, I mean, coming back, you know, from his vacation, mm -hmm. uh, that, that awful night, and, and the way he just kind of ran the ship mm -hmm. was quite impressive. Absolutely. He, um, he has been there from day one. Um, I remember after waking up from the medically induced coma and my mom telling me she was in the elevator at, at China, um, China's Children's Hospital and she didn't, at, she was just out of it and she heard this team of people talking and he said he was coming to visit some of the 
the survivors of the station fire and then she finally snapped into place and said that's my daughter you're talking about and she just was so grateful that he took the time him and his wife sue took the time to come and visit all of us i you know i was in a coma but they at least got to meet my family and it, he's been instrumental from day one yeah no doubt um from the fundraising side what do he do he's oh. he was a silent leader um he still gets his telephone calls returned and he wasn't afraid to ask for the benefit of, of the memorial park and he called in a lot of chits um, quietly didn't want publicity about it just said this was the right thing to do and he encouraged people to give and they did so you've raised a couple million mm -hmm. and the, the total budget is what 2.2 2.2 million which mm -hmm. so what does the two hundred thousand dollars left still mean to the to the operation what we need to, is to make sure we have an endowment that is a maintenance endowment that takes care of the property um, we had thought that we had enough with the two million dollar goal that it would be able to um, include that um, but what we found out was expenses a little higher um, expenses that were estimated three four years ago has increased like everything um, so we're looking at generating another two hundred thousand that'll go into a maintenance endowment so that um, we make sure the property well, takes care of the, the absolute tragedy uh, uh, on top of the tragedy would be that if this thing isn't pristine forever oh, absolutely you're absolutely, absolutely right. I, mean, I mean i mean this thing can't i mean you know a blade of grass every once in a while fine but i mean mm -hmm. this this thing cannot uh end up being neglected not on my watch no not not for mm -mm. ever yeah. absolutely and so is what what is the plan in perpetuity i mean the two hundred thousand dollars is for what period of time if, if we have an endowment of two hundred thousand it'll, it'll that'll generate itself. just enough money because we don't need a lot of money to maintain it mm -hmm. and for the next three to five years we've got people who are donating their time what we're worried about is when we're no longer active that next generation and future generations that we want them to know about the tragedy of the fire and um, we just need to make sure that it's being cleaned up it's being taken care of you know just just a fun so we'll have uh, information on foxprovidence.com about how you can make a contribution uh so make sure you go to the website and and we'll do that uh i don't know if there's a moral to the story mm -hmm. it is but after this chapter has been closed what's in your head and heart about it um that we can use it as an educational piece and that's our plan i want the families to and their the future children that are growing up to see this as a place of learning that this tragic event happened these incredible people passed away but we can learn from it um, there's a story wall at the back of the property that is a pretty educational piece and that's where we're hoping that the future will will re continue to read and continue to learn about what happened on that property um, and that's what's going to keep us safe All right. great work Thank you. Uh, Thank you. again foxprovidence.com uh, where you can learn how to help be right back Coming up uh, tomorrow night, we will have uh, Professor Mark Genest and Professor Rich Ehrenberg on the program, uh, each with their own perspectives on the Trump trip abroad, which was expansive, no doubt, and the split screen of what was happening in Washington, uh, reviewing the Russian thing and all of that. So that's tomorrow night's roundtable conversation coming up on our State of Mind. We'll see you on the radio tomorrow at 3 o'clock till 6, each and every weekday, of course, on WPRO. Make sure you go to Fox Providence to find out how you can help with the Nightclub uh, Memorial. Good night.